Landscaped Architect Tate Boring is into recycling. From native stones to ash juniper branches, he frames his hilltop home with respect for the earth. He cycled native plants and wildlife back in since he first arrived to Bermuda grass and a chain link fence. Now with 22 acres, Tate's committed to preservation of threatened wildlife habitat. About 85% of the landscape probably is native, or at least 85%. And the mainly the trees that we had were cedar trees. And so I, I didn't want to take out too many of those because that's all we had. There are a few oaks and a few other things. We trimmed out the dead out of the cedars and it, amazingly all sorts of native things started to sprout up. Since everything drains to Barton Creek, he avoids anything that contaminates runoff. Expansive lookouts gracefully blend into sculptural gardens. Outdoors and from inside, he can pick his viewpoint. When I remodeled the house, I uh, wanted to add a lot more windows. Almost every room has big windows and I keep the blinds open most of the time uh, just to bring the, the outdoors in. And it's a small house, it makes it feel bigger. Beyond the patio, Tate went to the next level of the hill with a pathway of various leftovers. Below, he installed an ash juniper railing along the narrow walkway. More of his tree prunings shield an outdoor shower. Moving down, he designed a pattern of raised vegetable beds to grow food on his rocky incline. The area where the vegetable garden is was a, a bank that's, that the previous owner had planted primrose jasmine. And so they, it was a pretty large area, but it was, and it was steep. We cleared that out and then started leveling. And those stones that, that the gardens are built out of, out of are really a collection of leftover rock from various projects that we've had over the years. From the patio, he softly defined entrance to the garden. Stacked field stones from the property naturally framed the rectangular backyard. In fact, most of the rock work here is, was rock that we collected on, on site. To me, it fits a little better if it's indigenous rock. And I've always appreciated the, the local stone people here, the, the Germans and the Mexicans and the Spanish that use the rock. A special recycle is a fig tree started from a cutting his dad passed along before he passed away. Bold columns topped with agaves anchor the broad view. I got these columns years ago, probably 15 years ago, from we had access to an abandoned quarry that we were allowed to come in and take out some stone. And we found these nine pieces of carved stone that had been put together at some point and then thrown away. I just felt like I needed to use them somewhere. There's three columns that sort of create a triangular space, one behind the pool and then two that sort of frame the pool. I thought it was a good place for the native Virginia creeper to, to grow up. Virginia creeper berries, eagerly feasted upon by birds, complement vibrant fall leaves. This native vine returns in spring after winter dormancy. To promote the back wall of the rectangle, Tate paired ash juniper fencing, field stones, and a lively assortment of living texture and color against a new pool. But I also really like the South American landscapes, the areas around Mexico City, the, the old Mayan and Aztec rock work. So, and since we used to be Mexico, I think it's fitting to have sort of that Mexican influence here. He lucked into the perfect topper for this column. Along the rectangle's left side, he planted to mimic the natural scape on the rectangle's right. This uh, landscape really evolved organically as, as we tried to capture little areas and clear out some of the woods, level out some spaces. He's taken a lesson from the hills with his plant choices. The worst of the drought in 2011, I just decided that whatever was gonna make it would make it and what didn't would have to be yanked out. Very little of this property is irrigated. I have two beds that are irrigated in the lawn areas, but the rest of it is just has to survive on its own. It gets a little bit of hand watering once in a while. Sometimes it looks a little tired in the middle of August, but as soon as we get a rain, everything perks back up. To formalize the rectangle, he chose Palisade Soisha. And I use it all the time, so it's, it's a great space to be able to have a big gathering or something. And it has a lot of really rich organic soil underneath. That's really the key to, if you're gonna have a lawn, to get a good soil depth so that the roots can go down, and that way it can survive through a drought. Ash juniper thinning stayed on site, transformed into a gate topped with a fig ivy arch. At a crook near the house, a wall built from his childhood rock collection recycles lots of memories.
On the other side, facing the driveway, he built a nicho as a memorial to Mr. German, the property's first owner, whose daughter was one of Tate's high school chums. In front, relocated rocks corral raised beds where dappled shade meets head-on sun at the edges. On a sunny spot near the house, he seeded habiturf, a blend of three native grasses. We seeded that sometime during the summer. It's filled in very nicely. I've mowed it twice. Beyond the driveway's entrance, he created a secret cove behind old doors he found. There was a grove of all cedar trees in there, and it was pretty thick. We cleared out of maybe four or five cedars and trimmed the dead from the rest of them. It really created a real interesting grove of cedar trees. To me, they're very sculptural. In this contemplative space, he planted low-care Zorro zoysia. We don't fertilize it, we rarely mow it. Even though Tate's garden is water thrifty, he makes sure that the animals aren't parched. A stock tank with recycled hardware refreshes critters in the driveway garden. Right up front, he built this raised miniature pond with cinder blocks sealed with plaster on the inside. He capped them with concrete and planted fig ivy to soften. I think having a little water in the garden, the sound and the sights, it, it, it helps maybe to forget how hot it is during the summer. In back, this pond is actually a galvanized horse trough. And then we collected rock from the site and rocked around it. It really attracts a lot of wildlife. We have frogs and toads both that show up almost immediately after these fountains were, were put in and the birds use it, uh, even the bees. A secretive bubbler is a big favorite. I'm always on the lookout for the right rock for something. So this boulder fountain, we drill a hole through and there's a catch basin underneath. It's a uh, very efficient use of water, but it really attracts the birds. Tate's made a lot of new friends, like this fox who appreciates his patio design. We noticed this female fox hanging around and she looked really tired. <laughs> and then one day we noticed four, four kits, pups, I'm not sure what they're called and they lived here for several weeks. So it was fun to watch those little guys grow up. As development pushes wildlife out of their homes, Tate's committed to give them a new one. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about native plants. You see a lot of bad examples, frankly, where people just put gravel in and have a few plants. It's a very versatile style to use native plants. You can, you can make it formal, you can make it informal. I think one misconception is that it's low maintenance. That's not necessarily true. I think native landscapes can be just as maintenance heavy, if not more so, than, than a traditional landscape. But it's really more about the efficient use of water and the, the lack of problems. I use absolutely no pesticides here. I have no problems with anything bothering these plants. You know, they were designed to live here.